Hello everyone and welcome to Heather's Happy Stitches. I'm Heather and today we are doing the much anticipated by me, Jack Skellington. Ooh, I know. So awesome, right? Let me see. All right, so let's get started. <coughs> so to make this faster, I, instead of just doing small sections like I would normally do, like this big, I'm gonna, just going to do a section that I would normally do all the way across. So that way it should be one, two, three episodes at most, so that that way we can get through him quickly, and it would make me very happy. So as you recall, I don't know if you do because it was quite some time ago, I oh, got some staticky static. We, uh, we reviewed this one and we reviewed this one and put it all together before, so, uh, we can just start it. That's very interesting. I just dumped out what was supposed to be 310 and it's very blue. It's not black at all. Let's see. Can you see that? No. <laughs> no. How about this one? Yeah, it's definitely got a more navy sheen to it. If I had to guess this, I would guess this is uh, 939 and not black. It's like navy blue. But it says it's supposed to be 310. That's very weird. Here. Let me see. These are diamonds out of my custom, my, my, uh, What's it called? Hua Can Custom that I had made. So let's see. They're squares, but they should be the same color. And I'm putting them in the smaller green boats. And then I'm going to keep them separate. I mean, they're pretty distinguishable because one's a navy blue and one's a black, but
Okay, so I'm using my cell phone and I'm hoping that the color shows through better because I can see the difference. This one is 9.39 and this one is the 310. To me, they look different. This one is uh, like a navy blue and this one is black. So these are the uh, what is supposed to be 310 out of the Jack Skellington painting next to the uh, 390 or 930 939s. Can you see that the colors match? And then this is the three tens next to what's supposed to be 310. See, because to me these are distinctly black and these are distinctly navy when compared to each other. And I did think for a second that I may have mixed up the colors, like put the wrong symbol in the wrong color. But if you look over here, the only really dark color is what's meant to be 310. Oh, look, you can see that really well. See, it's meant to be navy. This is meant to be black. But that is navy. That is not 310. But it's the only dark color in here. The closest one is this one. And this is gray. So I didn't mix up the colors when I was doing them. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you guys see that. Before I, uh, before I continue. And no, I don't have any, enough 310s in my stash to replace any of them. So... I guess I'm just going to have to have navy or 939 in place of black. I really hope this comes across better than I think it does. But at least in the bottle you can see that it is most certainly not black. Well, there you have it. The next time you see me, I will be, the canvas will be back and we will be doing some diamond painting. So let us begin with our not three tens. Story six of 30 ghost stories by various authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Davenport's Ghost by Frederick P. Schrader. Dear readers, do you agree with Hamlet? Do you believe that there is more between heaven and earth than we dream of in our philosophy? 
does it seem impossible to you that Alephus levy conjured up the shade of apollonius of tyana the prophet of magi in a london hotel and that the great sage william crooks drank his tea at breakfast several days a week for months in succession in the society of the materialized spirit of a young lady attired in white linen with a feather turban on her head do not laugh panic would seize you in the presence even of a turban spirit and the grotesque spectacle but would intensify your terror as for me i did not laugh last night on reading an account in the new york newspaper of a criminal trial that will probably terminate in the death penalty of the accused it is a sad case i shudder as i transcribe the records of the trial from the testimony of the hotel waiter who heard the conversation of the two confederates through a keyhole and of forty thoroughly credible witnesses who testify to the same facts what would my feelings if i had seen the beautiful victim with the gaping wound in her breast into which she dipped her finger to mark the brow of a murder about three o'clock in the afternoon of february third professor davenport and miss ida southchott a very pale and delicate young girl who had submitted to the tests of professor davenport for a number of years were finishing their dinner in their room in the second story of a new york hotel professor benjamin davenport was a celebrity but it was said that he owed his fame to somewhat questionable means the leading spiritualists did not repose the confidence in him that manifestly marked their regard for william crooks or daniel douglas home So, uh, while I was, uh, painting, you know, I was like, I need to get a bigger placer. And then I was thinking, I'm like, the diamond painting I just finished had three tens in it. So I grabbed those. Can you see that? There's not too many left in there, though. So... I'm not going to be able to do all of the F's, but I might be able to do his eyes and some of his suit. I'll see how far I get with these, but, but look, okay, look. Darn it. I put the fo darn phone down. There it is. Okay, there. Can you see that? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I can see it. See, this one here is 310, and this one here is what they say is 310. You can definitely see the difference there. So, but nothing to be done now. I mean, I want to do the painting. I really do. I'm just already super disappointed that the colors are wrong. I mean, I'm, but I mean, it's the night sky. I mean, I guess you could say it's like daytime and it, the sky is blue, but just darker, but I'll know. I'll know. Well, that didn't work well, as well as I thought it would at all. Okay. 
greedy and unscrupulous mediums the author of spiritualism in america thinks are to blame for the most bitter attacks to which our cause has been exposed when the materializations do not take place as quickly as circumstances require they resort to trickery and fraud to extricate themselves from a dilemma professor benjamin davenport belonged to these versatile mediums aside from this queer stories were afloat about him he was secretly accused of highway robbery in south america cheating at cards in the gambling houses of san francisco and the over-hasty use of firearms towards persons who had never offended him it was said almost openly that the professor's wife had died from abuse and grief at his infidelity but in spite of these annoying rumors mr davenport by virtue of his skill as a fraud and faker continued to exercise a great deal of influence upon certain plain and simple-minded folks whom it was impossible to convince that they had not touched the materialized spirits of their brothers mothers or sisters through the agency of his wonderful power his professional success received material ascension from his swarthy mephisto-like countenance his deep fiery eyes his large curved nose the cynical expression of his mouth and the lofty almost prophetic tone of his words when the waiter had made his last visit he did not go far the following conversation took place in the room there is to be a seance this evening at the residence of mrs harding began the medium quite a number of influential people will be there and two or three millionaires conceal under your skirt the blonde woman's wig and the white material in which the spirits usually make their appearance very well replied ida Souchot in a resigned tone the waiter heard her pace the room after a pause she asked whose spirit are you going to control this evening benjamin the waiter heard a loud brutal laugh and the chair groaning beneath the weight of the demonstrative professor guess how should i know she asked i am going to conjure up the spirit of my dead wife and another burst of laughter issued from the room full of sinister levity a cry of terror burst from ida's lips a muffled sound indicated to the eavesdropper at the door that she was dragging herself to the feet of the professor benjamin benjamin don't do it she sobbed why not they say i broke mrs davenport's heart the story is damaging my reputation but it will be forgotten if her spirit should address me in terms of endearment from the other shore in the presence of numerous witnesses for you will speak to me tenderly will you not ida no no you shall not do it you shall not think of it listen to me for god's sake during the four years that i have been with you i have obeyed you faithfully and suffered patiently i have lied and deceived like you i learned to imitate the sleep and symptoms of clairvoyance tell me did i ever refuse to serve you or utter a word of complaint even when my shoulders bent with the weight of my burden when you pierced the flesh of my arms with knitting needles worse than all this i imitated distant voices behind curtains and made mothers and wives believe that their sons and husbands had come from a better world to communicate with them how often have i performed the most dangerous feats in parlors with the lamps turned low clothed in a shroud or white muslin i essayed to represent supernatural forms whom tear-dimmed eyes recognized as those of departed dear ones you do not know what i suffered at this unhallowed work you scoff at the mysteries of eternity i suffer the torments of an impending retribution my god if some time the dead whom i counterfeit should rise up before me with uplifted arms and dreadful imprecations this constant terror has injured my heart it will kill me i am consumed by fever look how emaciated how worn out and downcast i am but i am under your control do as you like with me i am in your power and i want it to be so have i ever complained but do not force me to do this thing benjamin have pity on me for what i have done for you in the past for what i am suffering do not attempt this mummery 
do not compel me to play the role of your dead wife who was so tender and beautiful oh what put that into your mind spare me benjamin i implore you the professor did not laugh again amid the confusion of upturned articles of furniture the eavesdropper distinguished the sound of a skull striking the floor he concluded that professor davenport had knocked miss ida down with a blow of his fist or kicked her as she approached him but the waiter did not enter the room as no one rang for him that evening forty persons were assembled in miss joanne harding's parlor staring at a curtain where the spirit form was in process of materializing one dark lantern in a corner of the room contributed the light that emphasized the darkness rather than relieved it the room was pervaded by profound silence save the quickened suppressed breathing of the spectators the fire in the grate cast mysterious rays of light resembling fugitive spirits upon the objects around almost indistinguishable in the semi-gloom professor davenport was at his best this evening the spirit world obeyed him without hesitation like their lawful master he was the mighty prince of souls hands that had no arms were seen picking flowers from the vases the touch of an invisible spirit conjured sweet melodies from the keys of the piano the furniture responded by intelligent rappings to the most unanticipated questions the professor himself elevated his form in symbolical distortions from the floor to an altitude of three feet okay. i'm going to use these three tens to do his eyes real quick and maybe his neckline try and get in try and do as much of a suit as i can indicated by mrs harding and remain suspended in the air for a quarter of an hour holding live coals in his hands but the most interesting as well as the most conclusive test was to be the materialization of the spirit of mrs arabella davenport which the professor had promised at the beginning of the seance the hour has come exclaimed the medium and while the hearts of all throbbed with anxious suspense and their eyes distended with painful expectancy of the promised materialization benjamin davenport stood before the curtain in the twilight the tall man with the disheveled hair and demon look was really terrible and handsome appear arabella he exclaimed in a commanding voice with gestures of the nazarene at the sepulchre of lazarus suddenly a cry burst from behind the curtain a piercing shuddering horrible shriek the shriek of an expiring soul the spectators trembled mrs harding almost fainted the medium himself appeared surprised but benjamin recovered his composure on seeing the curtain move and admit the spirit the apparition was that of a young woman with long blonde tresses she was beautiful and pale clad in some light whitish material her breast was bare and on the left side appeared a bleeding wound in which trembled a knife the spectators rose and retreated pushing their chairs to the wall those who chanced to look at the medium noticed that a deadly pallor had overspread his face and that he was cowering and trembling but the young woman mrs arabella the real one whom he so well remembered she had come in response to his summons and advanced in a direct line toward benjamin who in terror covered his eyes to shut out the ghastly sight and with a cry fled behind the furniture but she dipped the finger of her thin hand into the blood from her wound and traced it across the brow of the unconscious medium the while repeating in slow monotonous tone that sounded like the echo of a wail again and again you are my murderer you are my murderer and while he was rolling and tossing in deadly terror on the floor they turned up the lights the spirit had vanished but in the communicating room behind the curtain they found the body of poor miss ida southchott with horribly distorted features a physician who was present pronounced it a heart stroke and that is the reason that professor benjamin davenport appeared alone in a new york courtroom to answer to the charge of having murdered his wife four years ago in san francisco
End of Story 6「Seven of Thirty Ghost Stories by Various Authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phantom Woman. He took an all possessing, burning fancy to her from the first. She was neither young nor pretty, so far as he could see, but she was wrapped round with mystery. That was the key of it all. She was noticeable in spite of herself. Her face at the window, sunset after sunset, her eyes, gazing out mournfully through the dusty panes, hypnotized the lawyer. He saw her through the twilight, night after night, and he grew at length to wait through the days in a feverish waiting for dusk, and that one look at an unknown woman. She was always at the same window on the ground floor, sitting doing nothing. She looked beyond, so the infatuated solicitor fancied at him. Once he even thought that he detected the ghost of a friendly smile on her lips. Their eyes always met with a mute desire to make acquaintance. This romance went on for a couple of months. Gilbert Dent assured himself that nothing in his life can possibly remain stationary, and he cudgelled his brain for a respectable manner of introducing himself to his idol. He had hardly arrived at this point when he received a shock. There came an evening when she was not at the window. Next morning he walked down Wood Lane on his way to the office. He always went by train, but he felt a strong disinclination to go through another day without a sight of her. His heart began to beat like a schoolgirl's as he drew near the house. If she should be at the window... He was almost disposed to take his courage in his hand and call on her, and, yes, even tell her in quick bursts that she had mysteriously become all the world to him. He could see nothing ridiculous in this course. The possibility of her being married, or having family ties of any sort, had simply never occurred to him. However, she was not at the window. What was more, there was a sinister silence— a sort of breathlessness about the whole place. It was a very hot morning in late August. He looked a long time, but no face came, and no movement stirred in the house. He went his way, walking like a man who has been heavily knocked on the brow and sees stars still. That afternoon he left the office early, and in less than an hour stood at the gate again. The window was blank. He pushed the gate back, it hung on one hinge, and walked up the drive to the door. There were five steps, five steps leading up to it. At the foot he wheeled aside sharply to the window. He had a sick dread of looking through the small panes, why he could not have told. When at last he found courage to look, he saw there was a small round table set just under the window, a work table to all appearance. One of those things with lots of little compartments all round and a lid in the middle which shut over a well-like cavity for holding pieces of needlework. He remembered that his mother had one thirty years before. Round the edge of the table was gripped a small, delicate hand. Gilbert Dent's eyes ran from this bloodless hand and slim wrist to a shoulder under a coarse stuffed bodice to a rather wasted throat. So I've got four more. Can you see that? I've got four more right there. Oh, that's trash. I've got four more right there. I'm trying to figure out where to put them. All right, next is eight. Eight. We're getting, getting close to starting the moon. 
super excited. All right. Police station. That she was dead, this woman whose very name he did not know, although she influenced him so powerfully, he was certain. One look at the face would have told anyone that. That she was murdered he more than suspected. He had seen no blood about, there had been no mark on the long, bare throat, and yet the word rushed in his ears, murder. Later on he went back with the police officer. They broke into the house and entered the room. It was in utter darkness, of course, by now. Dent, his fingers trembling, struck a match. It flared round the walls and lighted them for a moment before he let it fall on the dusty floor. The policeman began to light his lantern and turned it stolidly on the window. He had no reason for delay. He was eager to get to the bottom of the business. His professional zeal was wetted. This promised to be a mystery with a spice in it. He turned the light full on the window. He gave a strange, choked cry, half of rage, half of apprehension. Then he went up to Gilbert Dent, who stood in the middle of the room with his hands before his eyes, and took his shoulder and shook it none too gently. There ain't anybody, he said. Dent looked wildly at the window. The recess was empty except for the work table. The woman was gone. They searched the house. They minutely inspected the garden. Everything was normal. Everything told the same mournful tale of desertion, of death, of long empty years. But they found no woman nor trace of one. This house, said the policeman, looking suspiciously into the lawyer's face, has been empty for longer than I can remember. Nobody will live in it. They do say something about foul play a good many years ago. I don't know about that. All I do know is that the landlord can't get it off his hands. It was doubtful if Gilbert Dent heard one word of what the man was saying. He was too stunned to do anything but creep home, when he was allowed to go, and let himself stealthily into his own house with a latch key. He was afraid even of himself. He did not go to bed that night. As for the mystery of the woman, the matter was allowed to drop. It ended officially. There was a shrug and a grin at the police station. The impression there was that the lawyer had been drinking, that the dead woman in the empty room was a gruesome freak of his tipsy brain. A week or so later Dent called on his brother Ned, the one near relation he had. Ned was a doctor. Perhaps he was a shade more matter-of-fact than Gilbert, at all events. When the latter told his story of the house and the woman, he attributed the affair solely to liver. You are overworked, the elder brother looked at the younger's yellow face. An experience of this nature is by no means uncommon. Haven't you heard of people having their pet spooks? But this was a real woman, he declared. I, I, well, I was in love with her. I had made up my mind to marry her, if I could. Ned gave him a king, swift glance. We'll go to Brighton tomorrow, he said, with quiet decision. As for your work, everything must be put aside. You've run completely down. You ought to have been taken in hand before. They went to Brighton, and it really seemed as if Ned was right, and that the woman at the window had been merely a nervous creation. It seemed so, that is, for nearly three weeks, and then the climax came. It was in the twilight. She had always been a part of it, that Gilbert Dent saw her again, the woman that he had found lying dead. They were walking, the two brothers, along the cliffs. The wind was blowing in their faces. The sea was booming beneath the cliff. Ned had just said it was about time they turned back to the hotel and had some dinner, when Gilbert, with a cry, leaped forward to the very edge of the flat grass path on which they were strolling. The movement was so sudden that his brother barely caught him in time. They struggled and swayed on the very edge of the cliff for a second. 
Gilbert, possessed by some sudden frenzy, seemed resolved to go over, but the other at last dragged him backward, and they rolled together on the close thick turf. At this point Gilbert opened his eyes and tried to get on his feet. Better? asked his brother cheerfully, holding out a helping hand. Strange. The sea has that effect on some people. Didn't think you were one of them. What effect? Vertigo, my dear fellow. Ned, said the other solemnly, I saw her. It's not worth your while to try to account for anything. I have been inclined to think that you were right, that she, the woman at the window, was a fancy, that I had fallen in love with a creation of my own brain. But I saw her again tonight. We're on nine! Yay! Let's see... Let's see if Oogie Boogie comes out. You must have seen her yourself. She was within a couple of feet of you. Why did you not try and save her? It was nothing short of murder to let her go over like that. I did my best. You certainly did, to kill us both, said Ned grimly. Gilbert gave him a wild look. After luncheon, Ned persuaded him to rest watched him fall asleep, and then went out. In the porch of the hotel he was met by a waiter on his return, who told him that Gilbert had left about a quarter of an hour after he had himself gone out. Directly he heard this he feared the worst, having, as is usual in such cases, a very hazy idea of what the worst might be. Of course he must follow without a moment's delay but a reference to the timetable told him that there was not another train for an hour, and that was slow. It was already getting dusk when he arrived there. He felt certain that Gilbert would go there. He got to the end of the lane and walked up it slowly, examining every house. There would be no difficulty in recognizing the one he wanted. Gilbert had described it in detail more than once. He stood outside the loosely hanging gate at last, and stared through the darkness at the shabby stucco front and rank garden. He went down a flight of steps to the back door, and finding it unfastened, stepped into a stone passage. It was one of the problems of the place that he should have avoided the main entrance door with a half-admitted dread, and that, only half-admitting still, he was afraid to mount the long flight of stone stairs leading from the servants' quarters. However, he pulled himself together and went up to the room. It was quite dark inside. He heard something scuttle across the floor. He felt the grit and dust of years under his feet. He struck a match, just as Gilbert had done, and looked at first at the recess in which the window was built. The match flared round the room for a moment and gave him a flash picture of his surroundings. He saw the stripes of gaudy paper moving almost imperceptibly, like tentacles of some sea monster, from the wall. He saw a creature, it looked like a rat, scurry across the floor from the window to the great mantelpiece of hard white marble. If he had seen nothing more than this, he saw in detail all that first match had flashed at him, he saw his brother lying on the floor, a ghastly coincidence. His hand was caught round the edge of the work table as hers had been. The other hand was clenched across his breast. There was a look of great agony on his face. A dead face, of course. This was the end of the affair. He was lying dead by the window where the woman had sat every night at dusk and smiled at him. A second match went out. The brother of the dead man struck a third. He looked again closely. Then he staggered to his feet and gave a cry. It rang through the empty rooms and echoed without wearying down the long stone passages in the basement. Gilbert's head was thrown back, his chin peeking to the ceiling. On his throat were vivid marks. The doctor saw them distinctly. He saw the grip of small fingers, the distinct impression of a woman's little hand. The curious thing about the whole story, the most curious thing, perhaps, is that no other eye ever saw those murderous marks. So there was no scandal, no chase after the murderer, 
no undiscovered crime they faded when the doctor saw his brother again in the full light and in the presence of others his throat was clear and the post-mortem proved that death was due to natural causes so the matter still stands and will but where the house and its overgrown garden stood runs a new road with neat red and white villas whatever secret it knew if any it kept discreetly ned dent is morbid enough to go down the smart new road in the twilight sometimes and wonder end of story seven
All right. So I think I'm going to be done with four right now. Because I am super disappointed. Super, super disappointed. <sighs> I mean, for starters... The black is really blue. And I know at this point that is beating a dead horse, but the point still stands. It's blue, not black. And then there's no oogie boogie in this moon. Not even a little bit. I mean, uh, I know perspective you have to take a step back to get a good perspective. But even looking through the viewfinder, it may, it doesn't look like Oogie Boogie to me. I mean, it may look like Oogie Boogie on the computer while I'm editing instead of in the camera during the viewfinder. But from what I'm seeing, it doesn't look like Oogie Boogie to me. I mean, yeah. Oogie Boogie in that picture. You can clearly see Oogie Boogie. And this might be his smile, the M, but M is 20, but M is white. It's, can you see it? M is white. So even if it wanted to blit, even if it wanted to be Oogie Boogie's mouth, it'll just blend in with the, uh, <laughs> white. It would just blend in with the color that is currently there. So, even if I wanted to be Oogie Boogie's mouth, it wouldn't be. So, I'm going to stop for right now. I'm going to stop for tonight. Get this all loaded up um, and edited and posted. So that I can be disappointed with the rest of it later. I mean, I'm going to continue and finish no matter what I think at this point because I started it and my OCD won't let me stop doing it. So, and even if I tried to stop doing it, my OCD wouldn't let me start another project until this one is done. So, if you ever wonder why I don't do like whips and stuff, that's why. Because I can't stop a project and not finish it. Because then I won't be able to do anything else. Oh. So, there we have it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And have a great day. Bye!